This is Kentucky Afield Radio. This is Ron Rohde, Kentucky Afield's first host back in 1953. Now, I'm proud to present Charlie Baglin. For all the advances of modern America, one area where we continue to fail is the basic understanding of our wild outdoors, ecosystems, and what looks like scruffy, unsightly habitat to you and me is the honeymoon suite at the Hilton to animals. Bob White Quail, for one, an effort by the Kentucky Fish and Wildlife Department called the road to recovery is at its five-year midpoint. We go inside outdoors to discuss the grade. Next on Kentucky Afield Radio. When I'm 15, I'm going to be prom queen. When I'm 15, I'm going to have my own limo and private jet. 15 is a good year. Just ask Kentucky Fish and Wildlife. To honor our 15th anniversary of elk hunting, the new Pick 4 option doubles your chance to take home a trophy. When I'm 15, I'm going elk hunting. The Kentucky Elk Draw. Is 2015 your lucky number? Get your elk permit and dream big. SW.KY.GOV. Kentucky's Nature and Wildlife Fund. You see it as a contribution option when you prepare your state tax return. But you also see it as songbirds and wildflowers. You can see it in clear flowing streams. Sometimes it's so secluded you may never see it at all. But if you only see it on your PC as you prepare your taxes, that's good to you. Google it and see the difference this fund makes. Kentucky's Nature and Wildlife Fund. The natural tax shelter. This is Kentucky Afield Radio. There's a bird in Kentucky you don't hear much anymore, the bobwhite quail. Two people that know the most about that, Ben Robinson and John Morgan, will discuss the quail's disappearance. So since my association with this Kentucky Department of Fish and Wildlife, we're going back a quarter century, 25 years, one of the things that has been permeating the air has been the talk of habitat. When you talk about habitats, generally two things, loss of wetlands and grasslands that have been taken over by fescue, devastating the populations of songbirds, rabbits, bobwhite quail. Hey, we're losing bobwhite quail and it's because of hay fields. I don't know how many people make that connection. Uh, I don't know if there's a lot of people that make that direct connection. Uh, Maybe more so in Kentucky than other places, given that you know, we're still somewhat rural here in Kentucky. A lot of people have long forgotten the Bob White, to be perfectly honest. I mean, there's lots of kids that we go talk to, particularly if they have any urban tie at all, uh, barely know what a Bob White sounds like. So I think we are losing that connection between the land and Bob White to some respects. But I think in some areas now we've started to turn that around a little bit um, through good conservation work. And, you know, we're making some small headway there. And I think some people are hearing the Bob White call again. We didn't go into this plan thinking we're going to convert every acre of fescue across the state into native warmer season grasses or make every possible acre quality habitat. Would we love for that to happen? Of course. Mm-hmm. But we're realistic and we know that, that that's just not possible. So that's that's where the focus area approach really came in, where we can focus our efforts in smaller areas and have quicker success. You have this new quail restoration program called Road Recovery. You're right now five years into it. We're going to talk about the benchmark and how things are going for you. But before we do that, I want to go back and play a piece you and I did, John. This was in 2005. It was another program to help bolster the populations of Upland birds, bobwhite quail, rabbits, and songbirds. Let's listen to that, and then we'll come back. Wall-to-wall, or fence-line-to-fence-line farming. Not anymore. Many of Kentucky's property owners are finding a different kind of profit in wildlife. We'll plow through a few details next on Kentucky Afield Radio. Our state seems to be overrun with quail. Everywhere we turn, there are signs. Quail run, quail hollow, quail this and that. No town is complete without apartments, a golf course, or something named for the quail. And that's a good thing. Quail can give most anything that warm, earthy, natural feel. But does our interest go beyond just the name game? Truth is, the bobwhite quail isn't a bird you're likely hear while sitting on your back porch, unless your back porch is somewhere in the country. And even then, the likelihood is slim. 
because Kentucky's bobwhite quail population is down by 66% from what it was as recently as the 1970s. That's one statistic that has wildlife biologists, state and federal officials, farmers and property owners working together because in the absence of hearing quail, they are hearing the call for corrective action. It's a range-wide restoration plan designed to bring back the quail population to the population level of 1980. Wildlife biologist John Morgan with the Kentucky Department of Fish and Wildlife. John says the hit and miss efforts to help bobwhite quail over the years just haven't been enough. In fact, many critters, not just quail, have fallen through the cracks of modern America. Rabbits and numerous songbirds have historically depended on grasslands or shrubby overgrown habitats for their survival. These areas, of course, appear unkept and unattractive to people, so naturally we think we're doing the world a favor when we clear them out. What we're doing, actually, is forcing animal populations downward. But one conservation reserve program shows hope. Uh, The new program is called Habitat Buffers for Upland Birds. This is a continuous practice that we'll be putting field borders around row crop fields. We try to do those bunch grasses, and they have these bunches that have bare ground in between that provides opportunities for weeds that provide the seed, and also those weeds support insects, which are important food for quail. CRP's Habitat Buffers for Upland Birds can't restore quail numbers to all-time highs, but... If we didn't do this, we'll likely see quail continue to decline. Whether we'll ever ever get to a state where they'll be extinct in the state of Kentucky, it's possible. And in some states, it's more possible. Some states have already lost 90% of their quail population. We're not that bad off yet. We've lost about two-thirds of ours. So the time is now. We need to quit waiting and start working. And we're doing that. Through the federal farm bill, money is paid on a per-acre basis to folks who will set aside row crop field borders for 10 or more years to benefit wildlife. Kentucky's goal is 9,000 acres. So far, about half of that amount is enrolled. If you use a 60-foot wide border, you can go from Paducah to Pikeville and back two times. So that's how much habitat we're talking about. That's a lot of habitat across the state of Kentucky that could really benefit quail and other associated species. The Northern Bobwhite Quail Conservation Initiative is a range-wide effort across 22 states in which Kentucky is participating. 1980 was decided because of the ability for us to get back to a population level based on urbanization, habitat changes. It's the most likely reachable goal. If we try to go back any farther, the landscape has changed so much that 1980 was considered the baseline that we could possibly get back to in a realistic fashion. Um, Anything else would be shooting way too high and we'd be very unlikely to reach the goal. One obstacle facing grassland wildlife is as close as our yard. Green grass in Kentucky, chances are, means fescue. Well and good for people and playgrounds, but on farms and in open fields, fescue packs a punch for little animals. It's the sod that fescue forms, which is the major problem for small game. A quail chick is only the size of a bumblebee when it's hatched. So imagine trying to crawl through a fescue field. It's essentially a jungle to a baby quail. Western and central Kentucky is where bobwhite quail have existed historically and is the area of the state that holds the most promise for the animal's return. The prairie-type farmlands like the 1,100 acres belonging to the Newcomb family in Nelson County. We're going into an area right now that you can see we've taken some of the ridge tops and put in grain and we'll leave probably half of it for the wildlife. It's a drizzly day as we drive across the farmland but we're seeing habitat improvements in action. Jack Newcomb has farmed this area with wildlife in mind since the early 90s. About one acre in four is now in one of several habitat improvement programs for wildlife. Actually, most of the land that we've taken out of production have been field borders that were partially shaded during parts of the day. They were the less productive fields that were probably marginal to be farming anyway. There's a tremendous amount of farmland around this state that is farmed marginally, and if the farmer actually stood back and uh, could get an economic impact of what he's getting out of that farmland versus putting it in a conservation program, uh, I think he'll be money ahead by taking the marginal field borders out and putting them in the CRP programs. Two cubbies have jumped to eight cubbies of quail on this farm in recent years. By the middle of the next decade, farmhands hope to see that number grow to 20 or 25, a small but promising part 
of the state's goal of 135,000. People enjoy wildlife, and quail is one of those things they enjoy. A bird that says its name each time it whistles might remind us of the joy it brings to the great outdoors. 1980 wasn't that long ago, but it is far away in terms of where we want to be again. It's not the wildlife's fault that they're in decline, it's largely ours. But we are optimistic that practices possible now can reverse the trends. That's the 2005 effort. We'll fast forward to what's going on today. When we come back, this is Kentucky Afield Radio. We're back on Kentucky Afield Radio. I'm Charlie Baglin, John Morgan. And Ben Robinson have the dubious task of quail restoration for the Kentucky Department of Fish and Wildlife. And we're discussing quail and their road to recovery. In that 2005 recording, there were some terms in there, John and Ben, fence line to fence line farming. I don't know if I made that up or if that's uh, typically the way uh, farming is. Farmers will take advantage of every possible inch of ground to yield the most product. Is that still the way it is? Unfortunately, it still is that way in large portions of Kentucky, and we use the term woodline to woodline because, unfortunately, the fence rows have long been lost as well. Okay. What, what woodline or what fence lines there used to be are now actually mature trees, which are even less valuable than the old fence line monitor mm. that we used to have. So. Um, we have gotten some of those acres on the ground. I think we did that last piece. We were about halfway. We may have added a couple more thousand acres, but unfortunately during this last five-plus years since that piece, we've had explosive uh, commodity prices associated with corn and soybeans, making those acres extremely hard to put on the ground mm-hmm. because people were making far too much money raising an agricultural crop. So definitely dollars drive land management, and you know that's part of the solution. We have to have the public invest in conservation practices that are good for the land, good for water, good for soil, and good for upland birds. Habitat buffers for upland birds, that program, that initiative, is no more I trust. Oh, no, it's still uh, going. We just added uh, the center pivot corners, which isn't a big issue in Kentucky. Uh, You can now enroll the pivot corners on center pivot agriculture into these conservation buffer programs to help get those acres out on the ground since they haven't succeeded at the rate we'd hoped with row crop agriculture um, up against the edges of the field. So this is a new opportunity for those acres. There's a few of those pivots probably in far western Kentucky, but... You know, we're not going to make a bunch of uh, get a bunch of birds from that opportunity yeah. probably in this state, but yeah. other states. There was a goal in there. You said if we could do this, we could have that, which was if you could have this many acres enrolled, you could be able to do a a swath of of land all the way from Pikeville to Paducah and back. Right. And was that ambitious or was that reasonably expected? What did you wind up with, Paducah to Pikeville? I'd say we made it once. Maybe, maybe uh, a little more so. than one time. Probably so. Probably six, seven thousand acres is out there. Yeah, I think the the program was uh, ultimately very successful right out of the gate. But as John mentioned, commodity prices skyrocketed during the middle of that that program, and um, that really took us offline. Yeah, yeah, it did. There was a farm that was also mentioned in the piece that went from two cubbies to eight and they were hoping within a few more years that could be up to 25 or 30 and as far as cubbies were concerned there was a statewide goal of 135,000 cubbies do those numbers ring bells they ring bells. I mean, they were back to the 2002 National Bob White Conservation Initiative goals. And since then, the whole National Bob White Conservation Initiative plan has been revised. Um, and when we did our plan in 2008, we were uncomfortable trying to set a plan to meet those specific goals because we weren't sure what we were capable of delivering on the ground yet and what that would even yield when it came to actual Bob White response. 
So as Ben discussed earlier, we went that focus area approach to see what was possible, see what kind of responses are reasonable now in modern Kentucky land use. And, you know, once we get through this 10-year plan, I think we can go back. Uh, this is m- not a 10-year campaign. This is a 20-year-plus yeah. campaign. We're not going to fix you know, 50, 75 years of land management that hasn't favored upland birds and fix it in a 10 or even potentially 20-year time frame from a statewide level. We can fix small areas, which is what we've done. But In the benchmark report that I was, I was reading earlier, and you can find it on the Internet, uh, talked about sportsmen, sportswomen, landowners, it's just starting to sound depressing that it's just whatever the case is, you can't make the foothold in quail restoration, habitat restoration that you've really wanted. It has been bleak historically, and I think this report has certainly turned the tide for that. I think there's a lot of very positive success stories there, put a lot of proof of concept back in back into the habitat theme, which, to be honest, I think the department lost a lot of credibility historically because we made mistakes putting habitat in too small of places in poor landscape context, meaning they weren't close to other potential habitats, and we were able to correct that with this type of plan. The quote from your report here opens with something. Uh, it says, perhaps our single biggest goal for the first five years was aimed at generating hope. Hope in the form of habitat. Biologists have preached habitat for decades. Our landowners, sportsmen, audience have grown weary of the message. Too often, habitat didn't derive the intended result. Apathy became our enemy. Success will be our savior. As a whole, our focal areas have shown overwhelming support for the current habitat theme. So it looks like there's some hope for the new program. Sure. Yeah, and it um, you can take the conversation right back to the focal area concept again. You know, the negativity in, in that opening quote was really more about the past years and what we've done for a lot of years, several decades, with our habitat improvement program. We had a lot of successes. We also had a lot of failures, uh, yeah. and mainly because of the way it was implemented, and it was just scattered all around. Um, we tend to call it a shotgun effect, where we just went out and worked with anybody. We still offer that service, but to get you know the more profound results and the faster results, we focus down our efforts. And this you, plan, we worked in six focus areas, and all six of those areas experienced an increase in bobwhite populations over the last five years. So these are six areas across the state. Go ahead and list those off. Where are they? One at uh, Peabody Wildlife Management Area. They're in Ohio and Muhlenberg counties. Uh, we've got an area at Shaker Village in Mercer County outside of Harrisburg. The Clay Wildlife Management Area near Carlisle in Nicholas County. The Bluegrass Army Depot in Richmond in Madison County. A section of Hart County and a a section of Livingston County out west. So these are reasonably well spread across the state. Now this is where you are focusing your efforts to raise the populations. And those are just six areas. Does that sort of rule out or is that where we go back? to the Buffers for Upland Birds program of yesteryear if the local farmer wanted to come in and try to make a difference for him or herself? I think it helps certainly justify that there's value in those practices. Again, we can't overstep the value based on these projects because the key to their success was how close habitat was to other habitat. And we can't guarantee to every farmer out there at this point, depending on where their farm is located, if they put a 30-foot wide buffer on their field, that we can guarantee them quail. It's just not that simple. Uh, the landscape's just gotten too unfavorable for every farm to have that opportunity. But to say that there's not hope for the future would not be fair either. Uh, you just have to temper it. It's a, it's a delicate balance of, of trying to speak to landowners. It's important to keep in mind that communities of people will bring back Bob White. Not one landowner at a time, and that's where we've made so many mistakes historically, is we took that one landowner at a time concept. We need to put bands of people together to work together to make a meaningful impact to the land to bring quail back. And Charlie, you've you've referenced several times the, the Habitat for Upland Birds or CP33 program of yesteryear, if you will. The program still exists. Um, it's just gone a little stagnant. But since we talked about that piece back in 2005, we've had a much bigger success in the Farm Bill, you know, the Farm Bill type programs. And that's with the Green River 
CREP program or Conservation Reserve Enhancement Program. And that's about 101,000 acres of habitat spread across 14 counties down around the Mammoth Cave area, south central Kentucky. That's been a huge success, one of the biggest successes in the entire country for Bob White restoration. Since, since 2005, then, when we heard that original report, right, has quail habitat improved? Dramatically, yes. We've seen massive increases in Bob White. The Hart County focus area that we have in the report is the number one performing focal area with a 771% increase in Bob White in a five-year period. 771%. That's a number I can't fathom. 771%. Yeah, that's enormous. A lot Holy of cow. And you know, you didn't start with one quail and wind up with 771. You started no, with how many quail and then a 771% increase. Right. That's uh, like a J-curve to me. It's profound. And it wasn't just Hart County that experienced those. We've had several reports of hunters over the last few years, 8 to 11 cubby days, uh, whole parties, you know, three to four hunters getting limits of Bob White in this por- portion of the state, which is just unprecedented for decades. And that's there's very few places in the entire country that you can go and have that type of success right now. Uh, but you can do it in south-central Kentucky if you can get access to some of that property. That sounds amazing. With that kind of success, do you want to increase your focal areas? Is it going to hang on to these six for now? I think we would love to increase our focus areas, given the if the resources increase as well. They take, clearly, uh, money and manpower. Uh, we have plans to maintain our six, continue investing in those, but we would love to bring a few new ones online as well. You said the word we, Ben, and when we come back, we'll define this we and the partnerships that are helping make this possible. It's a healthy discussion on Bob White Quail in our Commonwealth. We have a fishing report just ahead, and then we'll be back with more on Kentucky Field Radio. This is Charlie Baglin back on Kentucky Field Radio, and we encourage you to like us on our Facebook page. If you would like to hear the show again, email the link to someone. You can find us on YouTube. Just search Kentucky Field Radio. We are also an iTunes podcast, and the website, myhuntingandfishing.com, will carry the show. So we're easy to find to listen again. More on quail just ahead. First now, our fishing report. <laughs> This is Tom with your fishing report from the Northeast. Cave Run Lake is still well over summer pool, which is causing some closures on some of our local ramps on the lake. Temperatures are in the upper 30s and low 40s, and anglers have been catching some fish in the backs of the coves. Target those banks that warm up the quickest. You're looking for areas where the morning or afternoon sun hits and that have shallow, sandy banks. Remember to fish low and don't be afraid to move. Busky fishing is also good in our streams this time of the year. Tigerts, Kenny, Little Sandy, and Kentucky River are a few good choices. You're going to fish slow and don't be afraid to move and target those warmer pockets of water. Trout have been stocked into Middle Fork of Red River, North Fork of Triplet Creek, and Main Stem Triplet Creek for the month, and Easy Walker Park in Montgomery County, one of our Fens Lakes, has also been stocked. Opportunities are starting to stack up around the district, so make sure you take the time to get out and enjoy it. This is Kevin Fry with your Eastern Area Fisheries Report. Some lakes in the area are back to winter pool, while few are still at summer pool or above this. All lakes are still murky or muddy. Largemouth bass action is very good for large fish shallow. Jigs, crankbaits, and spinnerbaits were catching fish well at Carr Creek, Dewey, Yatesville, and Patesville Lakes. Down trees and shoreline water are holding good numbers of fish. Rocky shoreline areas at Dewey have been producing crappie on jigs and small crankbaits. Depth was normally two to four feet. Warmer sunny days have produced some decent catches of channel catfish and shallow and caught on the bottom with cut bait or night crawlers. Also locally this week, we had rainbow trout stocked at Panbowl Lake in Bretha County, Martin County Lake, and Grants Branch in Pike County. Hi, this is John Williams with the Fish Report for Southeast Kentucky. Fishing is heating up in the district at Cedar Creek Lake. The big bass are shallow and up in the creeks. Then some nice fish caught on Alabama rigs, also on jerk baits, and even crappie fishermen are catching some bass on minnows. So the bass are three to five feet deep up in the creeks. Also, a lot of nice crappie being caught at Cedar Creek Lake, 12 inch and up, on jigs and minnows up in the creeks around structure. 
Also in the district, Kremlin tailwaters have been very good as of late. I've seen some nice uh, big brown trout, brooks, and rainbows. Caught on a variety of baits, including cranks, spoons, inline spinners, and also live bait. Late March, early April means walleye spawning at Lake Cumberland, Laurel, and Del Hollow. Those can be caught at night, especially on jerk baits, casting the banks with rattling rogues. As always, good luck and be safe. This is Kentucky Field Radio. During the break, I went out to Facebook, and I have posted the report on which we are drawing there, the five-year benchmark report for the Bob White Quail Road to Recovery. You ought to check it out. Go to facebook.com backslash Kentucky Field Radio and take a look at that report for yourself. Back after the break. Kentucky's Nature and Wildlife Fund. You see it as a contribution option when you prepare your state tax return. But you also see it as songbirds and wildflowers. You can see it in clear, flowing streams. Sometimes it's so secluded you may never see it at all. But if you only see it on your PC as you prepare your taxes, that's good to you. Google it and see the difference this fund makes. Kentucky's Nature and Wildlife Fund. The natural tax shelter. When I'm 15, I'm going to be prom queen. When I'm 15, I'm going to have my own limo and private jet. 15 is a good year. Just ask Kentucky Fish and Wildlife. To honor our 15th anniversary of elk hunting, the new Pick 4 option doubles your chance to take home a trophy. When I'm 15, I'm going elk hunting. The Kentucky Elk Draw. Is 2015 your lucky number? Get your elk permit and dream big. SW.KY. We're back on Kentucky Field Radio. The Bob White Quail Road to Recovery program is the topic, a program that is helping Bob White Quail populations rebound in grand fashion in focus areas around our state. John Morgan and Ben Robinson head the effort with Kentucky Fish and Wildlife, but you don't do it alone. Who are your key partners? NRCS and Farm Services Agency. NRCS is a Natural Resources Conservation Services. Those are you, United States Department of Agricultural Federal Agencies. Uh, landowners have been huge in several of our focus areas. We've got nonprofits like Quail Forever, the Quail and Upland Game Alliance, the National Wild Turkey Federations. I don't even feel comfortable naming them because there's yeah. so many. We're going to leave someone out. Well, um, did you say National the wild, uh, wild Turkey Federation has gotten involved in and also helped? helping towards quail management and habitat management. They've got a more of a habitat-based theme as they move forward, given the success with turkeys over the last, you know, three decades. Quail Forever and National Wild Turkey Federation. We're doing this to help quail, but if you help quail, you help a lot of things. Absolutely. So that would be a reason for their buy-in to the program. Yeah, we see a lot of partners see the opportunity that exists for Bob White. There's a lot of national momentum for Bob White. You know, what other species have their own farm bill programs aimed at trying to enhance them. So there is a special place in the nation's heart for the Bob White, and we're taking advantage of that. Some of our partners do as well, and that's great. We can all work together and get multiple benefits out of working for quail. You all like the Bob White quail. I've seen your license plates. I hear the jokes you tell and the caps you wear. What did you want to do with that? What about Bob? That was something from many years ago that... We put it on a brochure. You helped us make some signs for the license plate, you know, drive home your support for Bob White. Yeah. You came up with some creative slogans tied to the, the Bob White license plate, which has been very successful. We're getting 25000 plus a year from that. And we should talk more about that. That is a beautiful license plate. You see it with a Bob White coil on it. And that money goes to who? And how does it come back to help the bird on the ground? We've had a a relationship with Quail Unlimited. Historically is where that initiated. And unfortunately that organization has folded. But the Quail license plate has continued by creating their own nonprofit specifically to roll out the funds associated with the license plate. So annual Uh, I'll be meeting in just a couple of weeks with the License Plate Committee to award grants to projects that are largely generated by Kentucky Department of Fish and Wildlife staff and some Quail Forever members across the state and other quail enthusiasts to apply for those funds to reinvest into habitat on the ground. So they've been very targeted, uh, largely associated almost specifically with the Bob White Restoration Plan. Tell me what all we're going to help if we help Bob White quail. 
Oh, there's a whole whole suite of species that, that depend on the same habitats of Bob White. Uh, grassland songbirds are one of the first that come to mind. So we really target a lot of the non-hunting public to get behind us mm-hmm. and, and help us out. Uh, sparrows. Dick Sissels, Eastern Meadowlarks, Field Sparrows, Henslow Sparrows. Uh, those are just, just a few of many that, that use the same habitats. We mentioned turkeys, white-tailed deer, small mammals, reptiles. So just a whole lot of different critters share the same types of habitats of Bob White. Rabbits, of course. Yeah, a cottontail rabbit. rabbit. Are, are they on the same path of decline over the generations? Not as abrupt of a decline. Rabbits tend to be a little more cyclic in Kentucky, up with you know ups and downs, highs and lows in their populations. I wanted to say the word prolific, and and they are much more <laughs> prolific, uh, absolutely. But uh, our rabbits are in actually pretty good shape uh, in Kentucky. We're we're in an upswing right now, and we're seeing more rabbits over the last few years. My father was a mailman, and I'll bring this up because once upon a time, I went out and did a mail carrier survey. I rode along uh, somewhere in rural Kentucky, and I think we saw one rabbit, or it wasn't many, but do you still depend on the mail carrier surveys? Yes, we've been relying on those surveys since 1960. Still do them today. Uh, I believe we're still over about 800 mail carriers send us data every July on what they see on that weekly route in the last week of July. And it's been one of the mainstay trends that we've used to track quail and rabbit populations statewide. It's a really unique survey that's been highly successful for us. If, if you were looking at rabbits, rabbits, rabbits in my neighborhood, they're nocturnal. I don't see them during the day. Are rabbits more evening and uh, into the night type of critter? Absolutely. Uh, we even use uh, sometimes you can consider them crepuscular, which is uh, like a deer. Yes. Yeah, morning uh, eve. Very nocturnal, very active nocturnally. But the good thing is they haven't changed since 1960. They still are nocturnal in 1960, right. so we can still get valuable information about those observations, even though it's not the prime time to see them. Yeah. You still expect to see them at the same rate at that time of day because of their behavior. Right. So we can still use it as a very valuable trend of population, despite not doing it at the peak of their activity. So the road to recovery, halfway through. So this then would be a 10-year project. It's doing well for you? You give yourself an A, a B, or what? Tough choice? I, yeah. I, I, There's so I, many I'm facets. To give, our, to give us a grade, it's always tough to grade yourself. We're probably harder on ourselves maybe than, than others may be, maybe not. But um, Well, there, uh, were some, there are some goals here. I, I counted five goals, and within every goal, there's a lot of challenges. Probably too much to really go into here. But you want to stabilize Bob White population statewide. I mean, that sounds like uh, a whole department would need to do that and spend eternity doing it to stabilize. But for you fellas, I guess a little easier. Maybe not as hard as it it seems, or is it? Well, it, I keep referencing back to the focal area concept, and that's really what we're measuring our success on with this plan is, is how we've done in focal areas. When you take that into account, we're, uh, we've done better than stabilizing. We've shown increases mm-hmm. uh, at the statewide level. Um, no, we're, we're still experiencing downward trends statewide, uh, but I think we're getting better and better every year. Yeah, but I was just looking here at goal one, stabilize the population statewide. Right. Does that statewide mean, is that synonymous with the six focal areas? No. Or is that statewide? No, that's, that's like looking at the mail carrier data and having switching the direction of that line over a 10- or 15-year period to one that is sli- slightly going downward to where it's flat, and we're not losing anything anymore. Gotcha. Gotcha. So that, that's what we're talking about with stabilizing the population. And if you do look at the last 10 years, it's not as steep as it has been historically. Now, I'm not going to say in five years that we've really impacted that. The CREP has certainly had an impact in south-central Kentucky, but that's still only a portion of the state. So a uh, long way to go there. That's a really ambitious and bold goal. Uh, we'll be lucky to accomplish that in the 10 years. That would be more tangible in the 10, but we would have a long ways to go still to even do it in 10. Yeah, it sounds like some of these goals are going to be continuous. Till the day you retire, you're, you're going to be doing this. There will always be this challenge to maintain habitat, to not lose any more to development or just overgrowth or fescue. Absolutely. Goal. Absolutely. With uh, When you're managing for quail, it it's a constant, constant battle. You can't just go in 
plant some grasses, walk away from it, and expect to have quail from here on out. You have to constantly manage those areas. Goal two here, increase bobwhite populations, the focus area, which you have done. Goal three is increase bobwhite populations in focal wildlife management areas, which I trust you're doing. Goal four is increase statewide recreation. So try to develop a hunter interest in this. And then five would be generate funding mechanisms to support this restoration project. It can't be cheap. can't be. It's more than just the two of you. Do you need to give some financial incentive to landowners outside? You know, the CREP program I know does. But when you get these focal areas, were they chosen because they were inexpensive to do? No, we had a lot of favorable landowners already in those landscapes when they were in a private landscape. Of course, the Hart County was right smack dab in the middle of a hotbed of the the Conservation Reserve Enhancement Program that we talked about earlier with the 771% increase, and that was a lot of money. So we've worked with a lot of recreational landowners. They're taking advantage of Farm Bill programs, too. So you'll see that it's no doubt a money game in many respects. And we've relied heavily on the federal government's conservation programs through the Farm Bill to fund a lot of that uh, work so far. doesn't mean in the future that we can't see things change. Uh, I think a great example is no-till agriculture, and we may have talked about that before, on how you know there was a time where no-till agriculture was a practice that few farmers ever did. And then through incentives, they got farmers to start doing it. Now it's a mainstay practice that farmers do on their own with no cost share. Yeah. We're hoping that some of these practices will eventually take root to a level to where that's just how people do business. And I think that's not an unrealistic expectation. Some of the things will never meet that model, but several of them I think could when it comes to water quality, soil erosion. Uh, some of these things are just the right way to manage the land. And hopefully we'll have to continue to pay people to do these things things and it'll eventually be a part of uh, just good farming and that's what we hope to accomplish in the long run. What do you have to do to really make this a success from here forward and I, I read into the word philanthropist. You know we uh, goal five generating funding to support this plan is is one area that we've really fallen short on. You know the department really stepped up in a big way right out of the gate and helped fund this but the department can't be the only funder of this project. We're going to have to rely on partners, outside money, philanthropists, folks, you know, just willing to donate to the cause if we really want to be successful. Because quail restoration is, it does take money, I mean, clearly. So we're going to need to to ramp up our efforts with that. If you look down in the deep south, say in the plantation country in North Florida and in South Georgia, uh, there's landowners that are exceedingly competitive about how many quail they can get per acre. Oh, that's neat. Uh, Make a contest. Yeah, I mean, it's a real contest, and, and it's amazing, you know, how dense of quail populations they've been able to generate. i got to outdo landscapes. the dude in the next county. i got to do that. Does that apply here? Do you see that competitiveness? Unfortunately, we haven't yet. Yeah. But we, we would certainly <laughs> like, to, like to get to that point. Oh, that, that would be wonderful. That would be huge success when we make it to that point. That's great. We'll be back with more with John and Ben after the break. I'm Charlie Baglin. This is Kentucky Field Radio. Back on Kentucky Field Radio and our final few on the subject of Bob White Quail, the road to recovery, a meaningful effort to recover Kentucky. Nothing's cheap. If someone would come up, gentlemen, and write you a check, how much would you want? We set a goal initially uh, of raising $7.5 million was our goal that we, that we initially set in this plan. Uh, we're well below that right now. Uh, if somebody wanted to write us a $10 million check, we're going to take it. <laughs> Sure. <laughs> Absolutely. And you can do some uh, public information campaigns to spend a lot of that money because that's what we'd see a lot of it going towards is what? to start changing what pe- how people use and view the land. Uh, for quail, is all about people and people maintaining that habitat. And that's exactly what happened. I mean, a lot of department personnel in the field worked 
at exceedingly high levels to make this habitat happen and this response happen. And that included partners uh, and a whole host of people made these successes happen. And the biggest opportunity we have now is to, to cash in on those successes. People like to get involved on successful activities. Uh, this is a real opportunity now for the department to say, hey, we have something very positive going on. This is a great time to join the team and we're going to take it to the next level for this upcoming five years. In goal five, one of the challenges was to make sure people know that this has been done and make people aware of this, maybe a little what this program is doing right now. Is that the hardest part of this? In my opinion, the hardest part of quail restoration is changing the way that people use and view their land. It's a whole paradigm shift that we've gotten away from. And it goes back to clean farming versus messy farming and growing up areas and mowed and manicured pastures. That's probably our biggest challenge that we face. That's one thing we haven't talked about. What does this habitat look like? And it isn't pretty. Talk about why it is. (laughs) It is to (laughs) y'all. It's not a golf course. It's not manicured. It's not a horse pasture. I mean, it's scruffy. What are the words you use to describe it? Wooly. Wooly is a good one. You wouldn't want to walk through it with shorts on. Beauty is in the eye of the beholder, they always say. And, uh, you know... Again, for me, I think it is. It's uh, it's gorgeous habitat. A lot of times we try to incorporate wildflowers and a lot of color just for that reason to really hit on the aesthetics. Yeah. But, uh, but no, it's it's definitely going in the opposite direction of what most folks are used to seeing when they drive down any country road in Kentucky. You know, they're used to seeing the well-manicured, mowed uh, pastures, and this is the exact opposite of that. So that's why it's going to be such a challenge. So it's it. scruffy, it's overgrown, bushy, weedy. I mean, there's a lot of terms that people construe as negative that we actually consider as a positive. So there's the challenge right there, is getting people to change their way of thinking about So if you can get past that, a brush pile and you're somewhere in your back 40, you go out there and take a look at all the things that are using it. If you could see this habitat and all the wildlife that is using it, you might change your mind about how it looks. Well, that's the other issue you have with habitat that makes this challenging. When you have good habitat, sometimes you don't see the wildlife as much because they're hidden, screened because of the cover that you've provided. So it's sometimes that reward isn't there, but thank goodness you have a little bit of snow maybe. If the right side of snow, you can see the tracks. You, you can, can see, see the, the tracks. Um, so sometimes habitat actually impedes view of what people are actually managing for unless those people who really get up in there and you know from a sportsman standpoint they'll see the benefit but if you're just an idle uh, landowner hoping to see you'll see the songbirds I mean those will be real prominent but a lot of times you're a quail that's walking along the ground hopefully you hear them Uh, rabbits well you aren't going to see maybe not see the rabbits because they're shielded by cover and that's why there's more of them so so it's a real tough challenge You'll have to use your other senses. You can see them. You'll have to hear them. That's right. You'll have to see the tracks. You can't touch them, really. To to hear, there's other ways to observe the wildlife other than just uh, to see it fly in and out or walk in and out. That's why food plots, I think, historically have been so popular and so easy to sell to landowners and sportsmen and women uh, because you can draw them out into a wide open area and you can see them. Now, is that necessarily best for the wildlife overall? Not not necessarily really at all, uh, but it's good for the person who planted the food plot. And, you know, it's, it's a totally different theme that we're selling, uh, and it's a tough sell. Tell me this. Kentucky Department of Fish and Wildlife has done very well at restoring some species of wildlife, such as elk, such as river otter, peregrine falcon, And they do that by bringing them in from elsewhere and just turn them loose, essentially. Now, pen-raised, quail house-raised Bob White quail didn't quite work that way. What's that go back to, the lack of habitat? Did we just assume habitat was there and it wasn't? No, no. With Bob White's, um, you know, as an agency, uh, for many decades, that that was our approach, just to raise quail, put them out, thinking that was the ticket. Um, after years of trial and error, 
and a lot of research to back it, we learned that that's that it doesn't work. It's not successful. Uh, even if you had premier habitat and you dumped these pen raised birds out in the premier habitat, your survival and your reproduction is still going to be very low. Um, there's actually some studies coming out of South Georgia, the Tall Timbers Research Station now starting to really investigate this, and um, you know they're learning that um, there's a lot of things that go on. Uh, between mother and and egg and mother and chick interactions that that we don't even know we we didn't know about prior to this you know that we're just learning we miss out on that with pen raised birds um, so still probably a lot to be known about the the actual biology of why they're not so successful but uh, we have proven that pen raised birds are not the answer it's habitat and it's it's working to restore habitat to to improve wild populations so how do you feel about the future. I think the future is bright. I think if we can continue down a similar path that we followed over the first five years, uh, continuing to work in these focus areas, potentially bringing on a few new ones, um, I think we're poised to have a whole lot more success for Bob White. That's great. Now, where can folks learn more? Website? You could definitely visit uh, the Fish and Wildlife website, fw.ky.gov. You could visit our Kentucky Bob White Battalion Facebook page at facebook.com slash Kentucky Quail the Kentucky Bob White Battalion that I would encourage everybody to, to join and, there you go. and follow. That's um, You can really track our progress on that site. Them's the two. I always ask my guests, do you text and drive? Never. Never. No. He claims never. And you, Ben? Mostly no. Mostly no. Never. We, we will go with that as a... Uh, Probably not. <laughs> Gentlemen, good luck with this. I sure appreciate you coming out. Thanks, Thanks for having us. We are out of time. This is Charlie Baglin inviting you to join us again in a week, and we will go inside outdoors again right here on Kentucky Field Radio.